Good morning and welcome to our Climate Futures session. Uh, I'm Nate Byrne. I'll be hosting the event for you this, uh, this afternoon. Let's start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the elders, both past and present and emerging of the Wurundjeri people, uh, who are the custodians of the land that I'm on today. And I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which you are and our university campuses are situated. Though, these lands being the place of age old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. Very big welcome to all of you joining us today and to our amazing panellists. 2021 is a heck of a year. It follows an incredibly difficult period, but it's offering us some real promise. The time where people's careers might be up in the air and their futures might be under question. It's time for us to have a chat about how we can be part of the solution when it comes to climate. The challenges are very, very real, but so are the solutions. And I've got some of the most amazing brains from around this part of the world to help us figure out just how they got to where they are in their climate career. Maybe give you a few hints along the way. Let's uh, meet our panel uh, shortly. But first, I'm going, going to get under a, a little bit of um, a little bit of admin done first. Uh, look, this session is being recorded, so please place any questions you have, and we want to hear them in the Q and A function. Uh, our team of moderators will be going through that and feeding them to me. So we'll uh, we'll make sure that we get through as many questions as we can in the time we have. Now, the chat function is also activated. Uh, please know, though, it is public, so moderate yourself accordingly. Uh, we are also hoping that you would like to tweet today's live session. If you would, it's hashtag UniMelb Climate Futures. All right. Enough of that. Let's meet our amazing panelists, and uh, we'll we'll start. Um, I think. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Sarah Barker, I think, is the right place to start. Sarah, uh, good good afternoon to you. Uh, Sarah is the partner and head of climate risk governance for Minter Ellison Lawyers. We're also joined by Associate Professor Catherine Bowen from the Climate Change Institute uh, from Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. Joining us too, Dr. Lyndon Ashcroft from the University of Melbourne. Lyndon is a Science and Technology Australia superstar of STEM. Excuse me if you don't mind. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Gary Veal, the Executive Director for the Centre of Sustainability and Business, Melbourne Business School. And last but by no means least, Zebedee Nichols, Zebs from the Climate Energy College and has been part of the international panel on climate change. He's a contributing author. Good afternoon to all of you. Let's start off. Okay. Um, rule number one, we're going to keep it brief. In the very first question, we're going to go to every single one of you, 10 words or less. Why are you here? And I don't mean because you clicked the link. Sarah. I'm here because I forgot the ethics and followed the money. Oh, nice. Okay, excellent. Forgot the ethics, followed the money. Uh, I think this is going to make for a very interesting discussion a little bit later. Okay, but let's uh, go, Catherine, your 10 words. I'm here because I followed my passion and listened to my values. Awesome. Lyndon same. Oh. <laughs> Lyndon, same question. I'm here because I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. We'll allow you that inside the 10. That was, but yeah, yeah, I, th I think you're good. I think you're good. Uh, not being able to decide what you want to do. I think that's part of why I'm here and why I'm still doing what I'm doing and probably going to end up somewhere completely different as well. Gary. How about you, sir? Uh, I'm here because I met an Australian girl working in Canada. Awesome. See, there are so many things that can lead you to a career in climate. And Zeb, yourself? Uh, I couldn't believe we didn't know whether climate change is real or not. So I did a PhD in it. Oh, excellent. You're just about to finish your PhD, am I right? 
Yeah, in theory, I'll submit in the next four weeks, which will be a, a massive relief and a good feeling and a good moment. Yeah, I can imagine. And everything's everything's going well and to plan? Uh, definitely, there's been plenty of moments that weren't to plan, but uh, being able to see the end now is a really nice feeling and you can um, I can hang my hat on that, which is something. Yeah, so a lot of us on the panel here are scientists of one flavour or another. So, Zabi, finishing your PhD. Uh, I'm not a, a research scientist by any means. I did a bit of uh, forecasting. I'm a meteorologist. And oh, I'm here today because I love climate. I love learning about it. And I love talking to wonderful nerds. I want to get a feeling from all of you about uh, your careers, how you've managed to uh, do what you do and to be where you are. I also want to know about what it is that you do. Um, Let's start with Lyndon, because Lyndon and I actually have a bit of history together and some shared history. But Lyndon, tell us about, about your path here. Sure, Nate. It's, um, you know, any excuse to share the stage with you, virtual or in real life, is an honour for me. And I said I was here because I couldn't decide. And that has been true for my entire career, even in high school. I did maths. I did theatre studies. I did physics. I did English, you know. I always wanted to do a little bit of both. And in my undergraduate, it was the same. And then I did some science communication training, which you yourself uh, have done as well, up in Canberra, traveling around Australia, doing science shows for kids, which was amazing. But then I thought, no, I still want to do a bit more science. And so I came back and I did a PhD. And my career has kind of gone from doing research, doing not so much research, doing research again, doing not so much. But now um, I have managed to find a job that means I don't have to decide. I get to do both. So now I teach climate science and I do research in historical climate in Australia. But I also teach science communication because, as Catherine said, something that's really important is to follow your values and your beliefs and what I truly believe, particularly thinking about climate futures, is that the most valuable thing that I can give to help make change is to teach our scientists how to talk about their science. And that's what that's why I'm here. Yeah, you, you and I couldn't agree more on that. And we both love doing the communicating as well as helping other people do the communicating. Following your, your passion, I think, is probably going to be something that most of us end up talking about, uh, except maybe Sarah, who followed the money. Sarah, <laughs> tell me about what, what do you mean you followed the money? Okay. I'm a, I'm a partner at a corporate law firm. So I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm not an environment lawyer at all. Um, and even though um, you might um, presume that I'm passionate about climate change, which, spoiler alert, I am, don't tell anyone. Um, my career is very much founded on understanding that not everyone else shares the same values that gross generalisation, we do. Um, and um, my main client base are uh, old, uh, more uh, conservative, very busy people who have responsibilities to make money for other people. And so my shift into climate risk governance, which is talking to boards of directors about why climate change is a finance and liability risk and not an environmental risk, really uh, plays on that sphere of reference that is important to them. They don't care about polar bears. They don't care about koala bears. They don't care about um, environmental flows in the Murray-Darling Basin. They care about what their responsibility is, which is to make money for their shareholders. And the short fact is no one is going to make any money unless we operate the economy within the planetary boundaries that we have. But I very much phrase it to them as a let's make some money here rather than let's save the environment. Yeah, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? And I know I know what you mean when you say that they don't particularly care about the polar bears or the koalas, but I know someone who does, Gary, uh, that's a little throw ahead to something we'll talk about, I think, a little bit later in the session. But tell us about your pathway here. Uh, what, what, what is it you do? Um, yeah, so my pathway, I'm a biologist and science teacher by training. I uh, work for a helicopter company, a ski company in Canada, where I met my wife many years ago. And uh, I got sidetracked into business. 
So I spent a lot of my career in big consulting firms, uh, working on sustainability issues, but also working on broader uh, types of issues. I then realized that whilst I liked sustainability issues, I was really interested in nature connectivity. And I went back and did a PhD at Melbourne Uni in my late 30s. Um, and what I do now is that um, I'm leading a new center at the business school all around business and sustainability. Awesome. And Catherine, you're also obviously involved in climate science as well. What was your pathway there? Yeah, thanks, Nate. So I've, um, so I'm a public health person. I've been working in public health for the last 20 years or so. And I started off in a whole range of different public health fields. So mental health, HIV AIDS, women's health, surveillance, epidemiology. For example, I was in the WHO in Geneva when we had the H5N1 pandemic back, you know, 15 more years ago. But I've always been um, passionate about the environment. And I was was, I was interested in the, those public health fields, but I just felt that I'd really love to be able to merge the two. So my passion for the environment and my public health background. And it was when I actually came across the writing of Tony McMichael, and I, who, is a, who was one of the sort of groundbreaking researchers in climate change and human health uh, based in Australia. And I came across his writing when I was supporting some... Um, policy briefs um, to be developed around climate change and human health um, in the early 2000s. And I, it just um, struck me that this is an area that I can actually now uh, work on, this intersection between human health and environmental change, particularly climate change. So um, I started my PhD with him and the rest is history really, but but I, I call myself a pracademic. So I, I you know, do the traditional academic work. So I, I publish and I supervise students and I teach, but I also am directly linked with policymaking. So a lot of my work is particularly in the Asia Pacific region, working directly with ministries and not just health. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but with, in, with agriculture, with water, with urban planning and so on, and working directly with ministries to support their policy processes and planning. You've worked with the IPCC as well. Uh, so have you, Zeb. Tell us about that. How do you get to work on the biggest working group tackling the biggest problem that the world's facing? It's a good question, Nate. Thank you. I, so as I said in my intro, I was kind of interested in what's the physical explanation underneath uh, the climate change we're observing at the moment. So I did a physics degree to start with, and then from there... Um, yeah. yeah, me too. Physics is fun. Everyone, if you're not sure, just do physics. Go on. Yes. Yeah. If in doubt, just pick physics. It'll be fine. The math is hard, but it's fun in the end. Um, yeah. And so obviously quite a nerdy number cruncher. So basically love getting my hands on data, crunching numbers. Um, also write a ridiculous amount of code now. Um, so I basically did that in my physics degree. And then it turned out there were enough questions left over to fill a PhD. So I've been doing a PhD and I do, um, a lot of research into the models which are used for scenario categorization. So someone says, all right, here's my scenario, renewable energy costs plummet, and as a result, our CO2 emissions drop by 10% a year for the next 10 years, for example. Um, I help build the models which say, okay, that is a scenario in which global mean temperatures reach two degrees or two and a half or one and a half or whatever. And in the IPCC process, that's um, needed because there's a whole working group, working group three, which does socioeconomic scenarios, and they want to know what do all these scenarios mean in terms of global mean temperatures? So I kind of sit in between working group one, the physical science, and working group three, socioeconomic scenarios, doing all that number crunching. So they can then say, all right, this is a one and a half degree scenario, this is a two degree scenario, this is two and a half. Um, and I got pulled in from with my lead supervisor who's been working in the IPCC um, for about 15 years. His name's Walter Meinshausen. And I have just helped do that number crunching and we've just been working to make things better and better and more transparent uh, for the last four or five years or so. That is epic. Uh, for uh, those of you that don't know about me, the, the way that I got to uh, doing what I do, I'm the weather presenter on ABC News Breakfast in the mornings. If you're not watching, you should. You already pay for it. Um, uh, I started off 
just doing a degree at uni and in biophysics and then joined the navy of all things spent 12 and a half years driving ships around um specialized well i didn't spend that long driving ships most of that time uh specialized as a meteorologist and oceanographer uh, at the bureau of meteorology while still in uniform with the navy and then uh a couple of years after doing some some forecasting for a while, decided to ditch my uniform and just for a year and did the same course that Lyndon did, driving around doing you know, science shows for kids in remote and regional Australia, getting a master's of SciCom uh, from ANU and Questacon. Uh, and then as I put on my uniform, saw a job ad for news brecky television uh, weather presenter. Just thought that's a bit of a dream job never going to happen to me they'd never want me but i put my name in the hat and here i am how many of you and uh, please mics open have a have all yell over each other how many of you have gotten to where you are through some sort of uh moment where you never thought it was going to happen for you yeah absolutely that's exactly how i got my job because uh there were a couple of jobs going one was looking just at climate research and one was teaching just science communication and for the first time in my career I thought maybe I could just you know be a bit sneaky here and say hey do you reckon I could do a bit of that one and a bit of that one all the, the fun stuff never ever thought they would say yes but but here I am I'm, I think I'm the only person in Australia with the job of lecturer in climate science and science communication that's awesome. If, if you can't find it, make it yourself, right? <laughs> Lyndon, that's brilliant. Anyone else? Was there any moment maybe in your careers where you, th you thought, oh, this is a step too far? I'll, I'll try uh, something. Go for it, Gary. Um, when I first came to Australia back in 95, I ended up working in HR for Victoria Police and the police wrote to the Immigration Department and changed all my conditions because they thought I was an essential employee. And at the time, I thought, whoa, I'm so far away from what I trained in, which was biology science teaching. And, uh, and so I think it's also like sometimes doesn't matter how far away sometimes you get from what you think is your core. There's always a range of ways to get back into what you're really passionate about. Absolutely. Sarah, you, you have something for us there as well. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um Full disclosure, I've had uh, two fights with my husband in 20 years. One was in relation to the cutlery that was going on our wedding register. And the second was I stamped my foot in Maya, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, wait, wait, wait. Did you win? No. What? I know. I know. <laughs> you even he just foot stomp. Weird, yeah, I know. Oh, I wanted these knives that had funny handles and anyway. Um, and the second <laughs> was when as a corporate lawyer, having, having been a corporate lawyer for 15 years, I announced to him that I was going back to do my Master of Sustainability at Melbourne Uni. Oh. Um, and his response was, but you don't know anything about science or climate change, what are you going to contribute to this? Yeah, yeah, I won that one. Dangerous, yeah. I, I won that one. Um, so, um, but to take his point, um, at the time, and this is more than 10 years ago, as a corporate lawyer going into the field, um, initially was very much, oh, don't let Sarah near the mining clients. We don't want to offend anyone and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it was an uphill battle for a while. But as I say, when, when you actually frame the discussion around um, issues that are already relevant to the cohort you are talking to, um, it's a lot easier to get cut through than in trying to change minds. Yeah. Very dangerous, I think, telling people that they can't do something when they're quite mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. it. Um, uh, Catherine, I, I, want, I want to talk to you about that. Have you ever been told you couldn't? Um, well, not literally, but I suppose... Um, the example that comes to mind where, where I thought that I better do a good job here in one of the first sort of experiences working on climate change and human health was when I was um, working in Cambodia and I was supporting the government to 
develop their their first ever what we call vulnerability and adaptation assessment. So it's it's assessing what the um, country is vulnerable to, particularly around health impacts, and then developing adaptation options. And I was um, it so happened that the World Bank had one of their missions in inverted commas that they called missions, where the World Bank comes in like other many other donors and tries to survey the scene and decide where to spend their fifty million you know US dollars. And so I was sat next to the World Bank representative in in a meeting and um, he he just said to me, so what do we need to spend the money on? And I realised at that point it was so important to articulate very, very clearly how the health impacts of climate change are so interconnected with so many other um, determinants of health. So we're talking about food security, water security, um, the way our cities are planned and the way decisions are made. And so that example where I was really cornered in my first proper job working in climate and health just made me realise um, that I had I had the, the power to change things, but it was also quite a, a nerve-wracking experience at the, at the same time, and I knew I had to do a decent job. When people think about climate scientists or people who are working in climate, uh, they often think that you do need to be a scientist first, but I think uh, we, 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 some of us uh, represent that that's not necessarily the case, but for some it also is. Zeb, what skills do you need, do you think, to work in climate? Uh, I think it's a really multidiscipline problem. So I think pretty much every skill is going to be useful in some facet of the, the climate challenge. Um, in my particular field, it's obviously very numerical, um, comfortability with maths is really important and increasingly comfortability with um, programming and computer computer science essentially is really important. But to be honest, I haven't heard yet a skill which I didn't think that would actually fit into the client problem in some way, shape or form. Um, I think the other big thing for me has been I'm part of the Climate and Energy College at the University of Melbourne. And so it's a multidisciplinary PhD cohort and you know, we have people who work on um, stuff like in a city, where should you best build your roads to encourage um, the most efficient transport possible? And questions like that seem very far removed from my number crunching building models, but you still have conversations and overlaps and interests and tackling the entire problem is going to require um, pretty much every skill on the table. Um, I don't think there's any that can't be applied in one way, shape or form. Uh, Gary, you come from the business side of things at the moment and teaching first. What do you think? What skills are absolutely necessary for a career in climate? Um, so two points. My first one is like, like my own PhD happens to be in nature connectivity. So I think it's really important that we think about climate and also how it links to broader environmental transitions because there's a lot of people that will be um, on this call potentially or other people at the uni that have real expertise around, well, what's this massive transition that we need to make about climate, but also about biodiversity, about circular economy, about nature connectivity. And I think when you open it up that way, it actually opens up a, a ridiculous number of different types of roles that this touches in different ways. That's my, my first point. The second point is having trained a lot of PhD candidates, MBA students, et cetera, is I think this word like self-actualization, if, if you're really interested in something and it inspires you, it really shows. And so one of the best bits of career advice comes from someone at Harvard, one of their career advisors, he always said, in your 20s, do stuff. In your 30s, work out what really interests you and really focus in on it. And I think often we, we should really encourage people to try different things because you don't know where that's going to lead you. That's incredibly true. I mean, that's certainly the case for me. Uh, that the my whole career has just been a long litany of of just putting out my hand whenever some, that something's been offered, and I've just said, "Yeah, go on, I'll give that a crack and see what happens." Uh, Sarah, has that been your sort of experience, or did you always know that you were headed this way? No, not at all. Um, the, my other degree is accounting accounting and finance, and as I say, for the first 15 years of my career, I did antitrust law, so um, cartels acting for um, large corporations um, in their um, disputes with the ACCC 
etc cetera, etc cetera. so no not at all it was law um, always your your focus or law was always my focus yeah, yeah. Law what about always my five-year-old focus. sarah nah five-year-old sarah i didn't know you see five-year-old sarah was in the 70s snake yeah. so climate change wasn't big on the agenda yeah. um back then um no it was only after i'd had um, more than a decade working for big faceless corporations. Um, some of them are very nice people. Don't get me wrong. I love my clients. Um, um, but thinking, what does this mean? What there's got to be? There's got to be more to life. And it was coincidentally at the time where I had read in the paper the global footprint analysis that uh, I think WWF. Um, had first done on planetary footprints and looked at the productive capacity of the earth, divided that by the population and concluded that um, we've got about 1.8 hectares of productive land to sustain us each a year, but that we're chowing through four or five planets worth of resources if we're um, uh, an Australian. And to me, from a very accounting and finance point of view, from a very uh, corporate point of view, that is inherently financially unsustainable. Mm. And once that penny dropped, there is no going back. Um, so, no, it certainly wasn't anything that if you'd asked the 5, 15 or even 25-year-old Sarah, um, is this something that I envisage doing? No, not at all. I'm glad you are, though. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go back and tell five-year-old Sarah that's okay. She's she's going to be so. <laughs> no, five-year-old Sarah was still listening to her mum say, "When you if you pull the face and the wind changes, you'll stick. You'll stick like that." <laughs> hey, it's what happened to me. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> five-year-old Lyndon. What did five-year-old Lyndon want to be? Five-year-old Lyndon was going to be a poet. Oh, mm, yeah. Or maybe a secretary because I don't know, she's in the 80s and I guess uh, gender roles were maybe a little bit louder back then. Or she really liked organising things, which uh, still resonates with mm. me today. Yeah, but I think five-year-old Lyndon, 25-year-old Lyndon, 35-year-old Lyndon really likes talking to people, just like you, talking with interesting people and exciting people. And now uh, I think... In my role in teaching science communication with the University of Melbourne SciComm program, that's exactly what we get people to do. And that's what I get to do every day. We have so many incredible students here at the university and in our subjects, we get them to come into a room and understand each other. You know, it doesn't matter whether they're looking at growing oysters in Port Phillip Bay or if they're hunting for dark matter or if they're, you know, trying to find a cure for diabetes. They're all intelligent people. They all have their different levels of jargon and different levels of language, but they're all um, doing something important. And hearing about that, I think five-year-old me would be pretty pretty stoked that she gets to share in some of those stories. Yeah, I know there is actually a story in my family about uh, when I was about five-ish, when I said I wanted to be a weatherman. Uh, we now say weather presenter, but back then, weatherman. Um, but... I think it's because I knew that every adult needed a job and they seemed to only do about five minutes work. So that meant heaps of time to play. Uh, it wasn't necessarily because I was passionate about the climate. That came later. Um, I wonder for all of you, when and how did you really get the urge? I think, Sarah, I understand with you, it was when the numbers added up. Catherine, how about for you? When did you realise climate was your thing? I've, I've always um, had a passion for the environment. I think that that probably started when, you know, I was, I was taken probably when I was about five to the anti-nuclear rallies by my parents um, up in New South Wales. It's just um, always been a part of my upbringing. And we know that children who have um, a regular and close contact with nature generally are more likely to grow up with a greater respect for the nature that surrounds us. So um, it's, for me, um, it's become more and more important as I have had my own children and as I consider the legacy um, for them and their children and their children's children, it's become even more important. So 
Yeah, I think that it's funny. I was working in the um, in the public health um, COVID response for most of last year, as well as working on uh, climate change. My my day to day work, and my children would ask me sometimes, "Are you working on COVID or Mama or climate change?" And if I if I said um, climate change, they'd say yes, because I was just I was I was always motivated. I was enthused. And um, it was, yeah, it's something I'm so passionate about. So I, clearly that came out to my children too. I was a little more depressed when I was working in the COVID response. Yeah, I, I can't believe, okay, uh, can we just take stock of that for a second? You're, you're working on the world's biggest problem, climate, dealing with the world's most immediate problem, COVID, and dealing with two girls? Yeah, that's right. It was, it was actually, it was, I, I needed to at times last year, really um, consider my own, you know, health and well-being because I was shifting from one crisis to the next. And um, so my day-to-day work was in the intelligence unit in the COVID division in the Department of Health. Um, So this was the group that developed the situation reports that go out every day and do the EPI. Um, and then in the evenings, most evenings, I would be working on climate change. And, yeah, it, it came to a point where, um, and then, yes, have a family as well. So there was a lot going on. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, but congratulations. Well done. Please don't stop. Keep working and solving all of our problems for us. Um, Zeb, uh, five-year-old Zeb, what, what did he want to be? I actually wanted to be a tennis professional when I was five. Oh, do you still play? Uh, I Put the rackets away probably three or four years ago, um, as a result of elbow and shoulder injuries. Uh, but yeah, so I was pretty serious until I was like 11, and then I realized I wasn't going to go pro or make any money t- anytime soon. So I played at a more, um, still a lot, but not trying to go pro anymore level. And then, yeah, about 15, 16, I think I realized, um, that there were other routes, and that's when my kind of yeah, fascination with the physics of climate change started to kick in, and it, it went from there. So, um, yeah. If all else fails, if you can't tennis, uh, just ring up the IPCC and start contributing, right? Yeah, something like that. I think um, there was a lot more roots doing a physics degree and then I thought, figured I'd do a physics degree and something would pop up there. Um, so yeah, in my fourth year of my physics degree, we had to choose majors and do a, a thesis. And one of the options was on the economics of climate change, um, which is sort of odd for a physics degree, right? Because you kind of yeah. look at this economics and what's going on here. But one of the professors had decided that you could do a very basic model of how the two interacted and play with it and have a look at what mattered and what didn't. Um, so I broke his model and told him that I'd broken it. And then he said, all right, do you want to come and do your thesis with me? And that was how I ended up doing my master's thesis in uh, some very shoddy economics and some quite some slightly more sophisticated physics. Um, and things went from there. That's epic. You, you broke, <laughs> broke the lecturer's model and then he's like, come on and fix it for me then. Cool. Um, well, the secret is he wrote it in Excel. So it's quite easy to break things in Excel as anyone who's worked with it will know. Absolutely. Excel uh, is, is the bane of many people's existence, I believe. Uh, I find myself a little bit handy at it actually myself. I think physics, this is personally, if you're interested in a career in science, and I know that a lot of people will boo and hiss at me when I say this, but I think physics gives you a really, really good basis for understanding how the world works, even if it's not where you ultimately end up. I ended up doing physics because, and get this, people will probably switch off in disgust. I started doing a degree in uh, computer science. I took physics for fun. No joke, for fun. And then second year of uni, I just thought, do you know what? If you're doing it for fun, mate, you should just do it as a degree. I'm so glad that I did. Um, And yeah, it really helps, especially from the meteorological side of things. You can approach it a few different ways, but like the maths way, but the physics way means that um, it's really easy to build an understanding of how the world works, which is really key, especially when it comes to climate stuff. Um, Okay, I think... We should have a look at some questions from our audience because we've got a whole bunch of people uh, wanting to know a lot of things. Uh, One question here, how would you recommend breaking into the climate change field or area if you haven't worked in this area in the past? So like someone who has a business and an IT background, would you uh, jump across or would you need to start at the bottom per se? Gary, what do you reckon? Um. Okay, um, 
I think one of the things, like often in sustainability fields, in my experience, we're not short of people that want to come and work with us. That's that's just a fact of life. One of the things I always ask people is uh, basically to, to understand what they know about the backstory. So if you invest a bit of time in really understanding, you know, some of the, the back history of some of the key developments that have happened around sustainability, um, some of the key things that have happened on climate change, uh, have a look at things like, for example, the Carbon Disclosure Project, um, Investor Group on Climate Change, some of the different groups that are out there, because many of them are putting out a lot of resources and information um, that really helps you understand, right, what, what is some of the, the rationale and the history and what are some of the key terms that people use? Once you do that, what you may well find is that you, there are actually connections between your current role and where there are potential opportunities in climate change. Yes. Uh, Sarah, how about you? What do you reckon? Um, breaking in, like you, you, found, you found that the numbers didn't add up, but is, is it that easy? Yeah. And I, I mean, I was in the very lucky position that I've been in in the same firm for, you know, more than a decade. So when I announced that I didn't want to do competition law anymore, that I wanted to do climate change risk governance, um, they said, "Okay, <laughs> off you go." Um, but actually, hearing hearing Gary talk, um, um, it calls to mind the Karate Kid for me. So oh, you remember in the Karate Kid that Mr Miyagi was getting Daniel, I think his name is, to do to wash his to wash his car yes. and to paint the fence and all that kind of thing. Um, and Daniel cracked it and said, "Why are you making me do all this crap? I wanted you to teach me how to do karate." And Mr Miyagi said, "You know, wax on, wax off." I have that conversation with my juniors a lot. Because if they're in the finance team, rotating through the banking and finance legal team, and they say, but I want to do climate change. And I say to them, you are doing climate change because climate change is not a discipline. It's that confluence of everyone else's um, expertise and interests and discipline in relation to a particular topic but you need another kind of expertise that you're applying to it, whether it's being a finance lawyer, whether it's being a communicator, whether it's uh, being a health professional um, and putting the climate, climate overlay over to that. You bringing that specialty that you have to helping us solve this problem is what is valuable to me. So I know not everyone comes from a, a big firm background. If you're a small business person, I would suggest start putting up your hand, start volunteering so that when you see an opportunity come that is the confluence of your background skill set and climate change, you can take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, how did you break it? Uh, well, yeah, it was really... Um, I just decided I wanted to work with Tony McMichael, who I mentioned earlier, who who, who really spearheaded this uh, area on health impacts and climate change. And he was based at ANU. So I, I um, just knocked on his door. And, and um, the only way really for me to work with him was to enrol as a PhD student. So I enrolled as a PhD student. And um, for me at the time, it was good because although I'd started an academic career, I hadn't got my PhD, but I was able to continue my academic career while doing my PhD because we were working on grants we'd, we'd been awarded. So I was able to not, not step back in a sense to do my PhD, but just continue that trajectory. And for me, that was quite important because I was, um, I did my PhD, I suppose I was in my late twenties when I started. So um, yeah, I just knocked on his door and um, convinced him to take me on. That's awesome. And actually leads me perfectly to a question from uh, from one of our viewers who are watching right now. Uh, Lyndon, I might go to you on this one um, because Catherine's given us an idea there. For those who have done a PhD, how did your PhD opportunity come about? And what advice do you have for your pre-PhD self? What an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because PhDs can take a few different forms, right? Sometimes you can knock on somebody's door and say, I want to work with you and here's my 
idea that I really want to explore. I want to understand how climate change models work or I want to figure out um, how I can help the climate change and health connection. But for other projects, and mine was like this, it is a project that is fully formed as part of a bigger research kind of initiative. My project was, was pitched as part of a big um, initiative that combined lots of libraries and, and other universities and organisations and it was fully formed and advertised as a job essentially and so I um, contacted the, the person who became my PhD supervisor and asked her lots of questions and then I kind of said all right fine come and work with us which is maybe a harder choice because you have to find your passion within someone else's idea but it's also good because you can you know start with an idea that is already someone else thinks is good enough to spend three and a half years of your life on. So there are there are a few different ways to do it. Pre-PhD me should have thought about what the day-to-day -day looks like when you're doing a PhD. Nobody kind of, I remember when I started, a friend of mine said to me, yeah, but what do you like actually do? What do you, what do, you do? You don't go and measure frog calls or something. What do you just, what happens during your day? And so thinking about that. Is important and also making sure that you know your supervisor because you need to work very closely with them so trying to figure out how healthy that relationship would be and how you would work with them is a really important thing because that could make your PhD life-changing in a good way or maybe life-changing in a bad way. Mm, I am pre-PhD myself. I've been thinking Dr Nate does have a nice ring to it but I know that is the wrong reason to get a PhD Absolutely. But there is some stuff I'm pretty interested in, especially in the uh, in the science communication and the climate sort of region. So I've got my fingers crossed that I'll eventually sort it out. Zeb, you are moments away from completing yours. What would you tell yourself pre-PhD if you had the opportunity? Um, it's going to be harder than you think, I think would be one thing. Um, there's been a few moments of real, what am I doing? Where is this going? Um, I think the end of my second year, I hadn't really written anything. I wasn't sure about exactly how I was going to get from where I was to having the whatever it is, three, four, five chapters required to actually make the whole thing come together. Um, so I think that would be one piece of advice. I think the other would be to just do things you find interesting and you'll pull together something which works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was super lucky with my PhD. So I did my master's in, in England. And then wanted to come home. So I asked my master's supervisor, is there anyone in Australia you can recommend? And I was just lucky that Malta was in was in Melbourne, which is also my hometown. Um, but I think if you're interested in doing one, as Lyndon said, reach out to potential supervisors, email them, um, see what projects they're doing, actually get to know them because it makes such a difference. If you've got a supervisor you get along with well and you think you can work with well, it's great. And if something doesn't click, it doesn't even, neither of you have to be bad people. Just for some reason you don't click um, it's super, super difficult. So I think that would probably be the major piece of advice. I was lucky I didn't think about it, but it worked. But if you're thinking about doing one, um, spend some time getting to know your supervisors beforehand. Yeah, I, I like the idea of, um, of really allowing yourself to be guided and, and you know, to follow your, your heart as well, like not necessarily going, this is the PhD I'm going to do 100% the end, but uh, maybe having a... a broader view about what might be available and what work is is there to be done because um yeah it just like climate change is a problem that's affecting the whole world the solution comes from the whole world and uh having a really broad mind when it comes to finding solutions is um it's probably going to help us get there yeah. just to jump in nate I, yeah. I threw away the first year of my phd pretty much oh yeah so tell us about that uh so i started off and i was going to focus on aerosols in particular mm -hmm. um and their impact on the climate and how they're represented in the models I, I work on. Uh, but it turned out that I couldn't actually answer that question until I'd worked out how the models behaved and what the different options were and I've looked at a bunch of other models. So that became my thesis was actually just comparing a bunch of these models and um, the title now is on the state of reduced complexity climate modeling. Um, so I had a supervisor actually, or a person on my advisory panel who I brought on specifically to talk about aerosols and I've had to apologise to her multiple times because I told her six more months, six more months, never going to happen. Um, but giving yourself the freedom to say, you know what, actually, this is not what I want to do. Yes, it's been a year of thinking, but doing something else, um, I think, is really important too. 
Hmm. But it led you to where you are now, right? Exactly, yeah. So it wasn't a complete waste, but it, there's no writing in the thesis which points to that being the starting point. Yeah. Hey, Gary, your PhD pre-self, what do you reckon? Um, yeah, so I, I did the opposite of a couple of people where I, I was later in my career. I had a job and I went back and did a part-time PhD. Um, I started one and then I went deeper into it and changed my topic. But I, but I had a clear sort of focus area. I think the key thing for doing a PhD is to be really curious about what do you, want, what do you actually want to spend that amount of time studying? because uh, I had a couple of super, my, my main supervisor also uh, moved unis and one retired. I had a year without a supervisor. In hindsight, that was good because I went deeper into the field and, and that actually helped me to understand what I really wanted to do my research on. And being curious is definitely one of the, the combining factors, I think, that, that gets us all here to working in this climate world in one way or another, whether it's, you know, being curious about how to talk about it or being curious about how to study it. That's most of you or Sarah being curious where the money goes. Uh, yeah, that's something we all share. Uh, Catherine, I have a question for you specifically. Um, it, said, what would you, it says, what would you recommend to an MPH student to break into climate and human health industry? And there's a thank you already for you there. What do you reckon? Um, what would I recommend for an MPH student to do to do a um, climate change focused research project as part of their MPH would yeah. be a very practical step to consider. Um, and um, yeah, and, and just reach out to researchers and academics working in, in the field and, and, and um, you know, many of us mentor um, people out, outside of supervising um, students. So it's really important that, that we do develop our um, networks, I suppose, of people that are passionate in this area. So yes, I'd suggest as part of your MPH, uh, look at doing it as a specific research project. Um, and yeah, I'm also happy to be contacted if you're interested in just talking generally about climate and health. Oh, that's very generous and really, really cool. Thank you. Um, Can I just make a note, though, about the PhD discussion? And it's something that's it. not talked about often enough, I don't think. And it's it's about, um, you know, maybe people put off doing a PhD because they, they would like to have a family, for example. And I think it's really something that we need to be discussing a bit more about how, you know, um, decisions, particularly for women, when it comes to their careers and, and, and weighing up whether to do a PhD or not and how that might impact on um, having a family and taking time off and, and that sort of thing. It's just, I, I had my two children while I did my PhD and I felt that it was provided the flexibility and, and the um, autonomy that was actually really quite um, worked in my favour while I was doing a PhD. So it's just wanted to say that don't, don't let that stop you. Um, PhDs can be really flexible. And um, if you've got, a, as everyone else has said, a really supportive supervisor and panel, then hopefully that, that things will go well as in, in that perspective as well. So yeah, that's an important point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Uh, Sarah, let's, let's talk about um, the law side of things, the science, we've, we've got a heck of a lot of work still to do. Do you reckon that the law is going to be using climate or is going to be affected by climate uh, across much more than just, you know, the exact kind of climate change policy sort of area? Oh, absolutely. The climate change policy area, climate change law and regulation is such a tiny part of the interaction between climate change and the law. We're already talking about climate change litigation, but climate change litigation is just litigation that happens to have climate change as its catalyst. So there are human rights-based claims. There are tort-based claims where, um, for example, insurance companies have sued uh, municipal councils in negligence, failure to take reasonable precautions against reasonably foreseeable risk of injury, because they haven't upgraded uh, their stormwater and sewage pipes to be able to uh, cater for 
the extreme weather events that should now be expected rather than the ones that were expected in 1960. Um, in finance law, for example, we're helping our banking and finance clients craft the documentation that they need for all these wonderful new kinds of sustainability linked loans um, where the interest rate goes up or down depending on the sustainability performance of the borrower. All these kinds of things is, is why I say to my juniors, specialise in something and then bring your climate lens to it mm. rather than thinking that you have to specialise in climate change from the get-go. And actually on that, I'll, I'll stay with you uh, because I've got a question here. What areas in corporate Australia are good places for someone with expertise in physical climate impacts? Are there roles emerging in strategy divisions within companies or are these mostly done by external specialist consultants? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I get across my desk, I reckon four or five does anyone know a junior or mid-level uh, uh, manager that can come into the climate strategy team, the climate risk team, the climate analysis team, the reporting team, um, anything, um, any uh, corporate skill set that has a, a sustainability overlay is in hot, hot, hot demand yeah. at the moment. So if you can demonstrate that, that background kind of skill set, whatever it is, you will have a place in business. And if it is more that kind of physical client, climate expertise, the physics of it, um, insurance companies need you, banks need you. There are, are so many opportunities. So many. And Lyndon, uh, you talk to these people all the time. What are your thoughts? What are my thoughts on what people need? Well, like we're breaking in from a corporate side of things, maybe not just the science side of things, because as a science communicator, we often like we love to talk to scientists, but we often end up talking to everyone else as well. Right. So do you have any sort of any, any idea about that at all? I think it would come back to kind of following your passion. And when it comes to breaking in, being brave and asking those questions and, you know, taking advantage of opportunities that arise and sometimes finding those opportunities can mean uh, getting involved in networks getting involved in societies you know the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society for example it's primarily physical scientists interested in meteorology oceanography and climate science but we have a lot more people coming in from industry coming in from corporate organizations who want to be involved too and I think there are a lot of other professional societies that are, you know, health experts worried about climate or lawyers worried about climate, those kinds of things, and having those conversations. When, like you say, when I, if I give public presentations to those kind of groups, people are interested in, you know, a lot more questions than I expected, you know, and every time I give those talks, I'm learning more and more about, okay, this is what you want to know about. You want to know more about local things. You want to know more about action. In some respects, doing a PhD in climate science is super interesting. But when people call, when you call me and say, oh, come on, ABC and talk to me about the weather, you can talk about the weather. What we really need is people talking about the action. And so getting into that side of things is, is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, I completely agree. Yeah. Professional bodies are a great way of getting involved. And you said Amos. I very proudly got my Amos mask <laughs> that I wore today for World Meteorological Day. Uh, if you don't know this climate, people, the, you know, your, your colours, um, look into them. Hey, uh, I think, unfortunately, team, we are getting really, really close to having to wrap up. I'm gutted because I'm having a great conversation right now. Um, let's... Let's go for one more question. Let's get everybody on the screen at one time. Uh, so, because I, I think we, we can we can all have a chat for for the very last question, uh, which is going to be, what piece of advice do you want to pass on to those who want to work in a climate related field? Whatever advice that you think you would love to give, and let's let's start with Catherine. Catherine, what's your one bit of advice? Well, um, given it can be a stressful, depressing, generally hard going gig working in climate change, particularly its impacts, 
My piece of advice would be to identify what keeps you sane and motivated because it's really, really important that you stay well and healthy while you're doing your crucial work. So, yeah, identify what works for you to make sure that you're, you keep on top of things. So that might be going for a run. It might be your pottery classes. It might be your circus classes that I do. Um, but, yeah, just identify that, that particular um, important um, sanity mechanism. Awesome. Uh, and do you manage to keep yourself sane, do you think? Is that you keep on top of it? Um, most of the time, but <laughs> yeah. I do recognise when I'm going a bit over the, over the edge and so I can pull myself back just in time. Yeah, and of course there are stressy moments, but then there are also, you know, because of the work we're doing, moments of, of joy and hope and uh, yeah, seeing a, a real future. Uh, Sarah, what's, what's the one bit of advice you've got? Um, I, I often um, deal with um, my team where they're getting disheartened because, yeah. as, as Catherine said, we do, we do deal with very heavy uh, subject matter. My advice would be to pick a domino, which is basically focus in, as Catherine said, on, on something that interests you and don't feel like that your ability to influence the system is negligible. Because it's not about, to mix my metaphors, eating the elephant. It's about picking one little area and your area is a domino. It has flow-on effects to lots of, of other areas. So, so pick your little corner of the world and remember that it has the potential to have influence far more broadly. Mm. And isn't that really like the, the way that we have to be thinking about climate change generally? We all need to be doing our little bit uh, and it all has, it all adds up to a massive effect. Gary, same question. What's the one bit of advice you have to someone getting into a climate change career? Um, uh, broad advice, like we shouldn't look past books like Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's relevant across all our careers. Um, and one of the key ones is seek to understand before being understood. So if you want to work in business or in not-for-profits about climate change, really seek to understand what matters to them, what are they interested in, where's the value? So that's what I'd say. Excellent. Where's the value? Zeb, is that some advice you could have dealt with once upon a time? Or do you have something else you would uh, give to somebody who's aiming for climate change careers? Knowing where the value is is always a very important skill. Um, I would echo Sarah's comments that keep in mind that you're one small part of a much bigger puzzle. Pick the skills which you're good at and you enjoy. And if you want to put a climate angle, there is always a way to involve climate change in it. Um, but don't feel like you have to tackle the whole thing at once. It's impossible. Everyone needs to do their little bit and contribute what we can. And hopefully if we push enough dominoes, this will go in the right direction. Yeah, I like this domino story. It's good. Lyndon, final word from you. What do you reckon? What well, one apart, bit of apart from listening to all of the excellent advice that we've just heard, I would be following all of those, it would be to have conversations, not just in a professional sense, having conversations with people you'd like to work with and places you'd like to go, but also making change in the climate change space by having conversations at home, having conversations at the bus stop, having conversations at the checkout, having conversations with your friends about what you're trying to live more sustainably, what's working for you, what you're stressed out about, what information you're unsure about. Having these conversations and communicating this way is, is quite an important domino, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking is, well, it's something you love to do. It's something I love to do. And I think it, it's an important part of, of making sure the conversation is going so that everyone else can do the science that they need to do and our policies can match what we're finding out so we can tackle this massive problem. Hey, all of you, wow, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon for this great chat. I hope that we've uh, managed to give some people a bit of inspiration out there for for what their careers could look like, and especially at a time where uh, you know things are looking a little bit dicey for some. Thank you all so much for your time and uh, for joining us this afternoon. Give a wave. <laughs> Thanks all. Hey, um, okay, so 
what an amazing session. The next session coming up is beginning at 2.30. Now, it's an inter interesting and diverse panel of people uh, discussing the solutions we need for positive climate futures. It's hosted uh, by the Deputy Director of the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute, and it's going to be a great chat. Uh, now, Melbourne Climate Futures is a new initiative from the University of Melbourne. And this discussion is one of four sessions being held today. And if you want to find the others from tomorrow, they'll be available on the University of Melbourne's YouTube channel. More information on the initiative and upcoming events is uh, available at research.unimelb.edu.au. And we also have a great piece on the university's news channel, Pursuit. Now, you can read this at pursuit.unimelb.edu.au. AU. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Take care and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your World Meteorological Day.